right now this is the outside of the museum here in Kisumu and of course you'll also find an aquarium here I believe there might be even crocodiles here as well so we're gonna check that out together and first off we're gonna check the aquarium which is right here guys so these are some of the amazing things you will see here in Kisumu it's a bit dark though however but these are well, what's interesting about the aquarium they have incorporated and put fish which are all found throughout Western Kenya so for example right here this is the local fishes known as sire sire in lo locally but this the family name is Shelibede. I, I hope I pronounced that right but let me give you a closer glimpse of what is called here so you can do your own research or uh, butterfish it's known in English butterfish so yeah this is what what they look like and they're just really chilling like Larry here they're just relaxing here in the aquarium now this is the red spot Bob it's locally is known as Ad Adele and they're quite affluent in rivers and occasionally you might find them in Lake Victoria so I mean it's quite dark in here guys um, I'm not sure if my camera is doing justice but what I'm um, just to give you an insight these are all tiny aquariums in here that you can come and learn about the various fishes that are found in Lake Victoria guys and they even have some big ones as well this is a quite a popular one here in um, Kisumu and this is the tilapia fish okay tilapia and they're found throughout Lake Victoria is eaten quite a lot by the people here in Kisumu and throughout Kenya we also have the marble lungfish this is very good the local name is Kamongo and this is what it looks like it's a very big fish here and it's also found in Lake Victoria as well but actually in more swampy areas okay so this is what it looks like it's quite a big one Wow so if you're really interested and want to learn about various fishes that are found here definitely give the museum uh, I'll try when you come to Kisumu now this is Bear Dala Begi Dala and of course that is in the Lua language kind of like our good home that roughly translates as our home and traditionally not only amongst the low communities but other communities that live here the Korea the Luya the Abasaba different groups the Husi different groups throughout Western Kenya they all of course had houses built like this some of them of course will have had their own uniqueness and you know they have the the detached roof here and it's built in a circular shape which is very very good um, for for them and how how they lived in their region so we have a question that many of you may be asking and the question here is who are the Luo and it says this exhibition concerns itself with the Luo people found mainly in Nyanza province on the eastern shores of Lake Victoria roughly covering Kisumu, Siaya, Nyando, Rachonyo, Homobe, Suba and Migori Early historians interested in the history of the Luo used the term migration to refer to the movement of the river lake Nilot Luo speaker from the Nile Valley southwards through south southern Sudan and northern Uganda before their final settlement along the eastern shores of Lake Victoria in western Kenya. Recent scholars, however, have referred to the whole process as the Luo expansion rather than the migration that led the Luo to occupy vast territories exemplified by a widespread occurrence of Luo-speaking groups in the Nile Valley and most of southern Sudan, Uganda, Kenya, and West Africa. Very interesting topic here, and many people have different theories regarding the origin of the Luo people. 
And it is said that, of course, they had come from the Nile Valley, but they're saying they don't, they don't see it as a expansion, a, a migration. They consider it an expansion, meaning that they were throughout the region as, as far as up to Uganda and different places, because there you will find different groups of people um, like the Acholi and different people like that who speak the, their own dialect of the Luo language, which is mutually intelligible with some of the languages spoken here in Kenya. So very interesting, guys. So the, the, the way they did this museum, they tried to give you the most vivid feel of what it'll be like living in a village. Now, could you imagine, you know, you have this amazing grass everywhere. This is what your house would have looked like. And everyone, of course, there have been specific houses for chiefs, for someone's wives. There are certain rules and protocols that would have been followed. It was quite a sophisticated and unique communal system, which is very interesting. So we're walking into another section here in the museum that will give us more insights, I guess, into the back gate. Now let's see what it quickly says here in the context. The back gate, this was a functional operating in the fence that allowed other villagers to enter the home without having to necessarily use the main gate. It also offered the inhabitants of the home a shortcut to the kitchen and other cultivated lands behind the homestead. Important visitors such as in-laws never entered the homestead using this gate. So the back gate. So like they're saying for it's a functional opening. It's almost like a shortcut. You know, vill other villagers can come in and see and so on. And also the people that live here can use it as a shortcut to go to the kitchen areas and different things like that. But clearly it wasn't um, people who was considered special guests wouldn't have used this gate. So this is a uh, a visual rep representation of what it would have been like to live in the village a long time ago. I believe these people are doing certain cultural um, exhibits to represent the Luo culture and other communities in Kenya. So this is a man's hut, Abila. According to the Luo custom practices, the first son would exit the home and build an established right of his father's gate. This was the case for Anyango, the second son, who would build to the left, and the third son who would build to the right, and so on. Other factors would sometimes come into play and lead to the final decision from the customary practice. So you can see we have it's a very sophisticated culture of course there have been some people the first son would exit from a certain gate and different things like that so very interesting culture we're seeing here and this is of course what inside the homestead would have looked like there'll have been a part where someone can sit uh, can rest there's a part where someone can have a seat and yeah this is it here. So one of the things with the Luo communities and other communities in uh, Western Kenya, some of them practice polygamy and this house here is called Udu Oreru. 
the house of the third wife. Eh? Okay, guys, currently we're inside the Kisumu Museum right now. Now, one of the things you'll notice about this museum is a place where you will learn a lot about, of course, the Lua community, a popular um, tribal group here in Kisumu, Kisumu County, and also other communities that live in Kisumu and, of course, the western region here in the Republic of Kenya. Now, I'm going to start off by showing you, of course, the various languages and dialects that is spoken in the Republic of Kenya. Now, bearing in mind, of course, English and Swahili, of course, are the national languages. They're also what I'll say lingua franca languages because it allows people from different communities who are not from the same tribe to communicate with each other. But there are many languages spoken in the Republic Kenya, of Kenya. And they were clever enough to label the various languages, even dialects spoken by the people of Kenya. That is what that sign says. Now, there's a certain grouping here, okay? And it says Bantu speakers. You have a Somali group, okay? They have Karamojong group, the Kushite speakers, the Maasai group, the Luo, and the Kalenjin. Now, these are more, what would I say, in indigenous languages spoken here in Kenya, okay, long before Kiswahili and English, although these languages are the national languages and they are the lingua franca, they are also people who have their own indigenous languages. So we can see here in Western province, okay, we have the Kuria. Now, Kuria is a Bantu speakers, okay, and they're even very closely related to the Wusi group, Okay, so in Western, we see we have Korea, we have Rusi, we have Luo, okay, and we have Teso, and we also have the Luya speaking people, okay. Also, uh, you know, in the Rift Valley, close by, you have the Kalenjin speakers, okay, and that's what this map is showing. You have, for example, Kipsigis. There are many Kipsigis in Eldoret. We also have Togen, which can be found in Baringo. One of the first, not the first, but the second uh, president of Kenya, Daniel Arab Moy, came from the Togen community. So you can see throughout Kenya, I can't go through all of them, but there are various communities that live here. And of course, on the coastal side of Ken Kenya, that includes Mombasa, different places of course we know them to have great Swahili speakers but there are also other communities like the Giriyama people the Digo people the Durima people Taita people so these are individual and unique communities that are found throughout Kenya and like I said the map was showing of course you know Kushite speaking people um, you have the Somali group I guess they fall under the Kushite branch as well. So very interesting to learn about those groups of people here in Kenya. And, and that's what makes the place unique because you have different people, different communities all living together in this wonderful nation here. Okay, so here we have, um, well, they are stuffed animals now, but it's, it basically reflects the wildebeest and other bees that's found throughout Kenya, especially in the, uh, Ma Ma the Mara River, close to the Mara River, and of course the Mara National Park here in Kenya. These are some of the animals that are found. So we have a stuffed crocodile here, okay. There's also a lion, and uh, you can see the lion is attacking the wildebeest. So it kind of reflects some of the things you'll expect to see in the wild in those regions here. You know, the lion has been often called the king of the plains, and these are some of the animals they will uh, hunt and eat in the wild. Also have a tortoise, Kisumu giant tortoise, and it talks a little bit about it here. It's known as the Aldabra giant tort tortoise, was among the first live exhibits opening of the Nairobi 
Museum, then named the Corridon Museum in 1953. Now, this, this tortoise that you're seeing here was brought from the Seychelles Islands um, during the 1930s, and it was kept as a pet in Kenya before it was donated to the museum. So I guess they've preserved it. And yeah, this is what you will see here. All right, guys, I hope you're enjoying it. Moving on, there are some other things we're seeing here. And these are traditional baskets that can be found throughout the uh, region here in Western Province, Kisumu, other places. And let's see what it reads here. It says, baskets or containers have been made over a long period of time for a wide variety of purposes and techniques that is used to make baskets include, the techniques that is used to make the basket includes weaving, coiling, interlacing, and knotting. Traditionally, locally available natural materials were used to create the baskets, such as banana, fiber, sisal, grass, palm leaves. However, more recently, modern plastics has been recycled and these materials have become more popular to make baskets. So we can see here, guys, um, different uses. People will put food in baskets. People will store various vegetables. People will also put maybe even certain medicinal um, things in their baskets, fish, different things were the baskets was used very important in a communal setting and it's it can be found all over Kisumu western province and other parts of Kenya now of course in more modern time these type of uh, baskets or bags are used and as they're saying it's made from the plastic and grass and different things like that so very very interesting So this is head dresses. Now, if you really even go back to, let's say, the dynastic periods Tamirin. or Tamarin or Egypt, you will find that these head dresses were very much a part of the culture. Now, many groups in Western, the Luo people, even amongst some of the Kalenjin groups, uh, the Korea groups, and even some Gusi people, and uh, even Luya to some extent, some Luya groups, claim that they originally came from that side of uh, North Africa towards e Egypt and these places. So it's very interesting that we still find some of this culture preserved here. Now headdresses are worn on important occasion as a symbol of status. They are often used during cultural dances or rituals as um, circumcision ceremonies as a means to identifying certain age groups valuable materials such as rare animals, skin, feathers, hippopotamus, or the warthog tusk, and cowrie shells brought from the coast reflects their wearer's wealth, authority, and wisdom. Very interesting because once upon a time, um, a lot of people were used the oil of the hippopotamus. They made oil f um, um, from the hippopotamus, right, as an anointing oil for anointing various uh, chiefs and different things like that. And you also see cori shells brought from the coast. Well, cori shells was once considered, um, it was a form of currency. And this is a cori shell head dress here. And this will have been, of course, worn by someone of a great wealth status in the society. So we, we see some of these cultures still reflected here. And even as far as Nigeria and different places, cori shells was also used as currency. Wow, amazing. Now, of course, some of these things that we're seeing here in the museum is not practiced as much in modern times, but you, you do find some groups of people in the villages still hold on to some of these practices, beliefs, and they still adorn themselves with some of the things we're seeing here. So, clothing and personal adornment, as what you're seeing right here. Clothing was developed in response to the climate, environment, and activities of the people. Very interesting. So, they adapted what they wear to their environment. Animal skins and hide provided protection against cold weather in the cooler climates 
and are used by men and women for clothing. So of course, you know, we see some of the animal skin worn by people in different groups a long time ago. And that would have been important depending on how cold it is. I mean, as contrary to popular belief, there are some cold places in, uh, in, in Africa which rivals the cold climate like Europe. You go to some places like um, Mount Kenya and these places, it's very cold. So these are some of the things that have had to use to protect themselves, the animal skin. And also personal adornments such as earrings like you're seeing up there, and necklaces, bracelets. And these things were made from glass, shell, even metal and copper. So very interesting that we're, what we're seeing here. Moving on to food. So we have, of course, traditionally meals were cooked over an open fire in clay pots, not like the pots today, clay pots balanced on a hurt made of tree stones. Okay. Women and girls were primarily occupied with the preparation of food for the family. The staple foods were like millet, sorghum porridge, were mixed to a paste using cooking sticks like what you can see right now, the mortar and pistol there. Food were eaten from clay, wooden, or basket containers using spoons or cups made of shell, horn, gourd, or wood. So very interesting. So if we look inside here, we're getting an idea of what it would have been like a long time ago, traditional occupation, okay? So you can see someone is, uh, there's a woman there with a the basket. I believe that's peanuts on the ground there. We also have maize corn. So they're preparing something for food and different things like that. Now this is just a replica of what it would have been like. Now, here's what they say. There are three main groups of people living in Western Kenya. They speak the Lua, Bantu languages, and Kalenjin languages. They came and settled here at different times and brought with them specific skills and knowledge which contributed to the cultural wealth of Western Kenya as we know today. The Lua people, for example, were skilled fishermen the Bantu were mixed farmers and had special knowledge in agriculture, while the Kalenjin had special knowledge in cattle, goat, uh, goat uh, cattle, sheep, and goat breeding. So you can see each culture had unique skills which they brought and contributed to the development of Western Kenya. Uh, 